Aya. This video is just like a really short recap then of the different sorts of questions you might see in your A-level paper um, and sort of my approaches to how I would sort of structure my responses to them. Um, there are five main types of questions that you may well get, I'm sure you're aware of this by now. Um, each sort of increases with a degree of difficulty um, and each requires sort of a slightly different approach. So the plan is to go through each one of these sort of step by step and look at the command words you might get and how I would sort of structure my response to each one. So if we start with basics and we start with the four mark questions, the four mark questions really have four command words really that are a possibility to use. Um, some of these slightly more obvious than the other ones. Um, your main ones you tend to see are either describe or comment on. If you're commenting on something, um, I always think of that as a way of saying, well, how has something got to be the case? So you think about the reasons behind or why something is the case. Um, explain is sort of the new one that we're seeing more and more often at the moment. Um, and quite simply, you just need to set out the conditions for something um, and outline just what it says on the tin. So what are the main points towards an argument or towards a theory, for example? Um, really simple to answer these ones. You just need four really clear points here. And if in doubt, write them out as four separate sentences. Or you could do two really well developed points. Um, again, if you're not sure, make sure your response is factual. It's either evidence based. You can use names of examples here also for credit. Um, and make sure you're really clear. Read it back. Have you made four separate points? And if that's the case, it's yes, it's happy days. Um, if not, go back and revisit. And perhaps the easiest thing to do is just add an example that exemplifies the point that you've made here for four. Um, making a judgment on a scale is the only other big thing now just to sort of make you aware of and to get you to start thinking about. Um, the rest of the questions, I suppose, from here on out require you to sort of say, here is my opinion. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to avoid sitting on the fence. So forget waffly phrases like we can see that we might think that there are some advantages and some disadvantages because you're not really being clear on what your opinion and what your judgment is. And ultimately, that's partly what you're being marked and assessed on, isn't it? So phrases like I strongly agree with this. This stakeholder would believe this. But I think this this is quite important because if it's a to what extent question, use that in your answer. So to a limited extent, I think this. To a great extent, it could be argued that. Those are much better phrases to use. The sliding scale that I've put in here, again, has just got some key sort of points maybe to consider on the side. Um, if you're thinking perhaps about how successful something is, then obviously this scale here would obviously talk you through, wouldn't it? The sorts of phrases you may or may not wish to use. But these are just some good examples, I think, um, before we move further forward about how you can be really clear in your evaluation and avoid those sort of waffly phrases that we really don't like too much. So next up is your six mark analysis questions. Um, those of you that have been taught by me before know that I like to use the acronym FML. What does that mean? You've got facts, so quotes and data. You've got manipulate, so doing something with the data. Something is 10% greater than this. It's five times larger than that. It's three times bigger than. And then link. So can you link your figures then together? And if you did this twice, in theory here, you've got enough for six marks. If you're doing an analyse question, you don't necessarily need to explain the data at all. You're just purely telling me what's there and what the relationship between the data shows. So the example structure here on the right hand side would be how I might go about it. So I might look for an overview and a big trend that's there. Highs, lows, anomaly, manipulate some data. But as I said to you at the start, this sort of fact manipulate link structure that I've gone with here, I think sort of more than does the job. And it'd be something I'd be really tempted to come back to every single time. Um, the other acronym that you've got that some of others may have done is the MULT acronym. Manipulate, apply, link and trend. Again, that does exactly the same thing. Um, if on the day in the exam you can't see the link between the figures, that's absolutely fine. Just analyse and manipulate the data then that you can see in front of you because that is still credit worthy. So, top tip alert I suppose. Every time you see and your own knowledge in a question, that is code for use a case study. So, to what extent do you think this, using your own knowledge and the figure evaluate the statement is normally what it says your own knowledge must be a case study 
I would suggest a good rule of thumb is to consider every six mark, nine mark and 20 mark question must have a case study within it. So these six mark knowledge questions you get that are assessed on AO1 and AO2 normally have the following four command words. So it's either analyse, so looking at the relationship perhaps between the figure and how good your case study meets that. Um, suggesting reasons why something's the case, evaluating to what extent. I haven't really seen to what extent on the six marker, but it's possible and it could well appear. Um, so you look at the resource you've got, think about your case study. Is there a link between the two? Does your case study prove or disprove perhaps the graph or the data that they're giving you? Um, or does your case study exemplify the point they're making with the photograph perhaps? Does it disagree with it? That's sort of what they're looking for you to say here. So part of the credits awarded for your use of the figure and relating it to the context of the question. Some credits awarded for how well you understand the theme of the question um, and how well you can interpret that using an example. Um, always consider here that whatever point they give you in the question, you will need to counter. Um, and it's OK to counter with an agree and an agree but paragraph. You could do a disagree and I disagree further. Or you can do a positive and a negative. There's sort of no real set way here, as long as you're being really critical about the theme of the question and you're prepared to make a point for and also talk a bit beyond that point and say what other factors potentially might influence something, for example. Make sure you always bring it back to the question. I would suggest that on a six mark knowledge based question, you're writing no more than two paragraphs here. Um, and if you find yourself going off at a tangent, i.e. writing loads about a case study, I would always just bring it back to that figure and bring it back to that photograph to make it really clear that you have used the figure and the resource that they're giving you. Um, so nine mark questions. These typically appear twice in the paper, um, normally in that third section. So for us, this is in hazards and in contemporary urban environments. Those are the topics we've studied that have them in. Um, sometimes we see them appear with figures that are normally attached to some sort of evaluate type sentence. Um, essentially you need to do what you're doing in a six marker but kick it up a little gear um, so it needs a further paragraph to it you most definitely need to write a conclusion here in a nine marker um, that will withhold some credit if you don't think about how you're going to interpret the figure think about your example um, on a nine mark question I'd encourage you to think really carefully about the case study detail that you're going to select so if it's asking you to use it within a context of an example, so for example, if it's asking you to evaluate the use of suds in river restoration, for example, I would think about what you know about your suds example. So for example, we've done Enfield, and I would say, right, what have I got detail-wise on Enfield? And I would look at my case study detail before I decide whether I'm going to agree or disagree with the statement. What does my case study detail tell me? So that you're not left in your answer with some case study detail that you're trying to wrangle around to fit your argument. Um, again, you see I've put my example structure in the bottom corner here. Um, think about your sort of point, your evidence. Make sure you link it back to the question. That is the most important point I can make to you here. Um, and then obviously finish with that clear judgment. That conclusion is your perfect opportunity to do that clear judgment. So I almost consider nine markers to be mini versions of 20 markers. Obviously, you don't really need to make that much reference to scale and time. Um, but sort of consider that as a sort of structure that you may or well wish to use with your nine marker. Think really carefully about the figure, thinking about how you're analysing it. If it's data and it's a graph, I would suggest that you start by analysing the figure and the data this is in front of you. So last but not least, then 20 markers, the jewel in the crown, um, where majority of the marks are. These are split, so you get 10 marks here for your AO1. So theory, concepts, processes, case studies, examples, that all counts there. You get 10 marks for your AO2, so your analysis, how well you're linking it to other aspects of geography, the quality of your conclusion. Um, I suppose just a suggestion that I've put here about how you may wish to structure your response. I always consider sort of 10% to be the introduction, 70% on the main body and sort of 20% of my writing towards the conclusion. Um, for a 20 marker, that tip I just gave you about nine markers about looking at your line of argument and writing the case study detail down the note form that you're going to go with. Does it agree or disagree works quite well. Um, introduction, I think two to three lines max I've put here, tops four I would suggest. What are your key terms? What's the point? Where is the geography in your essay? Why are you studying about it? Why are you writing about it? What examples are you going to use? That's the sort of thing you should be telling the examiner in introduction. Um, your key points, I suppose, go in your next paragraphs. I always see this as like two really meaty paragraphs um, or three sort of slightly smaller ones. 
I talk quite a lot about this flip-flop technique, make your point, counter it, now counter your counter argument, can you counter that again? That sort of continuous analysis and weighing up of ideas is what the examiner absolutely loves and what they want to see. Your conclusion should aim to show off all six of those skills. And what do I mean by six skills? Well, your theory, your concepts, your case study, you're linking it, obviously your conclusion because that's what you're writing in, um, and your analysis. That's your sort of last chance, isn't it, to tell the examiner and show the examiner you've got each six of those skills that they're looking for in that 20 marker and you can demonstrate those. It's a nice opportunity to do prediction for the future. Um, think about a sort of scale. So this is my prediction for the future and however it may impact on a global scale or however the impacts are much going to be much more localised over the next 10 to 20 years. That's the sort of stuff that makes the examiner sit up and listen. Um, the temptation sometimes, I think, with 20 markers is to overcomplicate it and to try and stick to one case study. If you think you've got two smaller examples that would work better, do that. Likewise, don't be tempted to try and cram too much in um, and think about doing three case studies or four case studies and try and do too much. Um, I'd be really crucial on time here. You've got 25 minutes to write this, so I don't think it's possible that you can do three case studies, enough detail and enough justice. Unless, of course, it was urban policy, then you don't really have much choice because you've got three case studies for that that you would need to use. Um, so always bring it back to the frame of the question. Highlighters work well here. Highlight the knowledge and the geography in the question because that's what you're going to talk about first. Um, and make sure you understand what the geography is in the question. If it's not clear to you when reading the question what the geography is, go back and unpick it and think about what sort of purpose, what are they getting at by asking the question? Because you've got to understand what the geography is and what the theme is before you sit and write a couple of sides of A4 based on that topic. I um, hope this has helped massively. Um, if it hasn't, please do come and chat. And if you've got questions, go and definitely chat to your geography teacher ahead of the exam. Um, but feel free to go back through the video and take screenshots and stills if you need some of these reminders ahead of your exam. Very best of luck.